I'm uh, here with uh, Joan Carling, who's the Secretary General for the uh, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. How are you today, Joan? I'm fine. That's Quite good. an overwhelming day of listening to all the presentations. Yeah, I think it's been a, it's, it's definitely been a good, good conference yeah. so far. Um, I'd be interested to know from you um, to start off with. Um, some of the discussion that, that's emerged in the ADP um, is uh, is around monitoring and 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 the contribution that can be made to um, the uh, sort of the measuring, reporting, and verification process um, when it comes to carbon emissions reductions, which is a very important component of Red Plus. And um, so, through your work, what have been your experiences so far? Um, with uh, the way in which Indigenous peoples are, are, are engaged with, yeah. uh, with MRV and, um, and, 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 uh, and measuring, reporting and verifying carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let me first start to say that uh, Indigenous peoples in Asia co comprise 70% of the total Indigenous peoples in the world. And we're talking of more than 200 million of Indigenous peoples and majority are, are, are located in, in the forested areas the, as part of their territory. So that means red plus and, and forest conservation in general is very, very critical to indigenous peoples. And that's also the reason why a lot of indigenous peoples have decided to engage in the process and also to send the message that, that for us, uh, forest is not just carbon, it has other co-benefits and it has multiple values that has to be taken into account and thereby it requires the full and effective participation of, of indigenous peoples in all processes of, of RED, including MRV, as well as to ensure that our collective rights, particularly to our uh, forest customary rights, are, are recognized and, and respected and that we are entitled to equitable benefit sharing throughout the Face, faces of red. Now, if we go to the MRV, uh, I think there are two components that, that requires the full, full engagement of, of indigenous peoples. One is the issue of the monitoring of carbon, and the second is also the monitoring of the non-carbon benefits, as well as the enhancement of biodiversity and the way in our rights are being respected. So it's also a matter of monitoring the safeguards uh, and the benefits, the entitlement to benefits uh, to indigenous peoples. So uh, the, I think that is very, very critical if we want the MRV also to, to be able to provide for uh, the needs and priorities of, of indigenous peoples. In the um, <clears throat> in the UNFCCC discussions that are currently occurring um, this year, um, there's an emerging issue around the safeguards information system, yeah. um, and that looks at the adequacy of the guidance that exists at the moment for the safeguards information system and the type of information that yeah. um, that will be fed into the the safeguards information system. And some recent research that's been undertaken by C4 has, um, has identified land tenure yeah. as being really the number one yeah. issue um, or the number one challenge um, when it comes to um, being able to properly and, and adequately implement Red Plus. Yeah. And I think back to, um, I think it probably would have been 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. when there was a very strong no rights, no yeah. red campaign yeah. that, was, um, that, was, that was moving forward. And I'd be interested to know what your thoughts might be when we think about the types of information that would be useful for a safeguards information system um, and, and what your thoughts might be there um, in the context of land tenure. Yeah. Um, do you think that would be a useful type of information to be fed into um, a safeguards information system and reported on at an international level? Certainly, because that's, that's the crux of the matter as far as Indigenous peoples are concerned. And, and, and that requires developing some key indicators in terms of how land tenure uh, is being addressed. For example, uh, as one key indicator is how much land are demarcated for the recognition of land tenure of Indigenous peoples and how our ways of 
managing our resources are also being acknowledged and, and recognized for defining the terms of benefits, uh, for in the, the entitlement to benefits, not only in terms of carbon, but also the non-carbon uh, benefits. The other area that has to be accounted for is the issue of collective rights of, of lands and not just the individual rights because that's now, I fear, as the trend in terms of recognizing community land rights, that they're breaking up community land rights into individual titles, mm. which completely undermines the whole issue of collective ownership and management of uh, forest and other resources by the people that benefits everyone in, in, in the community and that opens up uh, the possibility to elite capture of the benefits. So for example, if we look at past experience like the PES, the Payment of Ecosystem Services for Community Forest Management in the past, if we look at Vietnam, who's been rich in, in terms of this issue, the way uh, it has been arranged is through individual lease of former community land. So suddenly, the other members of the communities became the workers of their own community land and being paid by the person who leased. So mm -hmm. there's suddenly the, 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 the relationship, I mean, the, the elite capture was there, but also the system is not any more equitable. Because when we talk of equitable, it should also account for providing the needs of the poorest of the poor, as well as accounting for the needs of women. So we're not just talking equ equitable in, in, in the abstract sense when, when you talk of how, how uh, land tenure is going to be managed and how entitlements are going to be given to, to the communities. Mm. And I think that the um, I think the issue of, of tenure also goes beyond, um, beyond beyond one of just simply land tenure as yeah. well because um, when you start to move into the discussion about benefits whether yeah. they're um, financial or non-financial yeah. types yeah. of benefits that may derive from um, from uh, from these types of uh, of, of, of frameworks, um, then you also get into discussions around rights to carbon yeah. that may exist. Um, and um, another area that I find interesting is is the issue of intellectual property yeah. um, and uh, and indigenous peoples um, and 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 in, and intellectual property. I know that uh, there's been um, you know especially in a pharmaceuticals context. Yeah. You know there's uh, there's yeah. it's been a big issue. Yeah. And it's not really something that has um, come up um, yeah. to any significant extent yeah. in the in the context of uh, of, of the climate change yeah. um, negotiations. And yeah. it was raised by um, I think it was the I think it was raised by the Philippines yeah. at the um, at the ADP intersessional recently in the context of. Um, transfer, so technology transfer, yeah. um, as being a, forming a part of the new climate yeah. agreement, yeah. Um, and uh, and so I'd be interested to know. We have, um, you know, we have this these systems coming yeah. through where um, where there's you know, a lot of money being spent yeah. on um, on MRV systems and technology, yeah. and we have systems around safeguards monitoring. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to know from you uh, some examples of of I guess unique approaches that would come from indigenous peoples and um, and what that may mean or how that may uh, how that may sort of equate to uh, the potential for, for intellectual property yeah. um, to exist uh, yeah I, I think the problem now of the issue of intellectual property rights is that it is privatized it's in a private context where the owner is entitled to the benefits of, of, of that particular knowledge or skill. But from the perspective of indigenous peoples and from our traditional values, uh, we look at these things for the common good. So you don't privatize something that can be shared for the common good. So when we're talking of, of resources, it's a resources that should be shared by, by, by everyone so that everybody benefits. So I think that there's a co contradiction in the way we look at, at, yeah. at, at things, that, that it, it's a common property. We operate f from the value of common property and for the, for the common good. So for example, you're talking of carbon rights. We will claim carbon rights not in the context of private 
individual ownership, but the ownership of the community and thereby the, the benefits should be also for the community in an equitable manner. So, so that, that, that is where we are, we are coming from. Yep. So when you mm. talk of carbon or even the use of, of medicines, it's for the benefit of, those, the, of the people who are sick and needing that kind of medicine. And it's not for somebody to take ownership of that plant and sell it for somebody who's sick. You see, so, so that, that, that is the, that is the, the area that, that, that we are trying to express or, 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 or mainstream our views that we should always look at this in the, in the context of the common good and not for private or individual profit or, or benefit. Yeah, yeah. I'm from um, I'm, I'm from Australia, and so in in, in Australia, it's been um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting developments around um, around Indigenous peoples' uh, land rights related issues and yeah. native title in Australia, yeah. and um, it has <coughs> largely maintained a, a circumstance where it, it is that collective um, yeah. that collective ownership. Um, yeah. And uh, and yeah, I think that it, it is. I mean, it certainly um, does yeah. raise um, serious concerns where that begins to be. Uh, where that begins to be uh, broken, yeah. broken down, yeah. Um, yeah. and um, so uh, okay. Well, that's uh, that's been very uh, that's been very useful. I mean, we're we're in we're in Indonesia at the moment. I mean, it'd be, be useful. I know that I know that uh, AIPP has um, has has done some some work and, and and looked at some of the issues here in, in Indonesia. I think that it's perhaps worthwhile mentioning um, what I think was a landmark decision of yeah. the Constitutional yeah. Court here in yeah. in Indonesia. Um, do you see there as being some progress being made in, in Indonesia around the around the, the, the tenure issue um, uh, arising from from that decision? Have you have you noticed that there's been a sort of a move in the right direction, or are you are you sort of seeing things going possibly in a uh, yeah, in a I different think, direction here? I think the the constitutional court decision is really a mile, my, my, uh, milestone achievement. But it, it also requires a complete ter turnaround of the mindset, uh, particularly of the forest uh, department in Indonesia, as well as some local governments. Because uh, uh, from what I gather from my colleagues here from Amman is that the way the, the, the decision w is going to be implemented is according to local governments because of the autonomous, autonomy law yeah. which, uh, of which they will operate that at, the, at the local level. And they have different interpretations and different attitudes mm. in terms of, 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 uh, forest, uh, of customary forest. So it's still in the dark on how it's, go it's going to be implemented. Yeah. But, uh, but the legal recognition already set the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, eventually, eventually in indigenous peoples will benefit tremendously from this law. And I think that the critical point now is, is, is for indigenous uh, communities in, in, in Indonesia to, to really claim it on the ground like what they've been doing they're, they're already putting marks in their territories they're already doing uh demarcation of their territories aman has demarcated more than four million hectares of uh, of customary forest uh, land so that has to be recognized legally by local authorities and by the national government so there needs to be further harmonization i i think in terms of how they will operationalize that court decision yeah. to ensure that it's it, that that in indeed the the uh masyarakat adat of indonesia are, are going to to be protected by this law. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping that I'm hoping to see some some progress made there too. It's, yeah. uh, I think that Aman have done some yeah. brilliant work yeah. um, from a from a yeah. legal perspective. Yeah. I think that they've done some some very brilliant work yeah. um, there. So I think yeah. that as going forward, I think that it's yeah. in. Uh, it's in, yeah. it's in good hands yeah. uh, as well, yeah. we hope. So, um. I, I just want to add that pro perhaps uh, in, in all my work with indigenous peoples in Asia, I think RED has opened up really mm. a, a lot of, 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 of discussions and has surfaced and highlight indigenous peoples in a manner that has never happened in the past. Yeah. And it has put on the table the issue of land tenure particularly collective land tenure of indigenous people. So now 
governments like Vietnam, uh, Thailand are, are moving into that direction, which has never been considered yeah. in the past. So there are very positive uh, developments and positive signs along the recognition of, of land tenure of, of, of indigenous peoples. Uh, however, there's still a long way to go in terms of really the governments having the political will to really recognize and respect collective land rights and allowing people to decide how their resources are going to be used. And I think genuine partnership along the recognition of, of the collective rights of indigenous peoples is the only way that RED is going to succeed in a manner that co-benefits and an equitable development is going to take place. Yeah, I agree, and also um, I, th I think also building on that point, I, uh, if you take a, if you go back a few years, there was a very, I think, clear sort of tension that existed more yeah. so between um, conservation work that, that's being undertaken and yeah. and and indigenous peoples' rights related yeah. issues, and I think that. Um, I think that Red Plus and, and the discussion that's been happening around Red Plus has yep. done um, done a great deal to to, to to move more in the direction of, of bridging those gaps yep. um, as well. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that it's uh, I think it has given rise to, to some very yep. useful discussions, but yep. um, but still a long, as you say, a, a long way to go. Yep. Um, I think, yep. um, and uh, so yeah, so that's been I think a very a very good conversation, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, been. Nice to talk to you.